Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to learn about section 2.1, organizing qualitative data. And the things that we're going to be focused on, our learning objectives, are to organize qualitative data in tables, construct bar graphs, and construct pie charts. So first, let's talk about raw data. When data is collected from a survey or a designed experiment, it must be organized into some kind of manageable form. And then data that's not organized is called the raw data. So let's start with organizing qualitative data in tables. First, qualitative, or another way to call this is categorical variables, are uh, variables that allow for classification of individuals based on some attribute or characteristic. So basically what this means is a some type of quality. So you can think of like an uh, attribute or a characteristic as a quality or a category that you're um, organizing your data by. So qualitative data are observations corresponding to a qualitative variable. And now let's start now with this frequency distribution and we'll get into an example. A frequency distribution lists each category, okay, so remember category or quality of data and the number of occurrences for each of those categories. So here's our first example. A physical therapist wants to determine types of rehabilitation required for her patients. To do this, she obtains a simple sam random sample of 30 of her patients and records the body part requiring rehabilitation. So this is the raw data. And we want to construct a frequency distribution of the location of the injury. So this is raw data because it's not in any kind of organized manner as you can see. It might have just been as she went through the files, she just started to write down where the injury was located in no particular order. So then what we're going to do for a frequency distribution table is we take the categories, organize those, and then we pretty much tally how many occurrences there are in each category. And so if you notice, back occurred the most often with 12 and then wrist, elbow, and so on. And so the tally marks can help you when you organize your data because you can just count them at the total at the end. You can just make tallies as you go down your raw data uh, list and then count the totals at the end. So just a caution here, the data in this table are still qualitative meaning it is based on qual a quality or a category. And then the frequency simply represents the count of each category. This is not to be confused with quantitative, which we'll talk about in another section, which has to do with like a, a numerical value. So now let's talk about relative frequency. So frequency, we just talked about how many occurrences something had. Relative frequency, think of this word relative. So it's the proportion or percent of observations within a category, and we can use this formula. Basically, it's relative frequency because you're relating the frequency to the total. So relative frequency is the frequency divided by the sum of all frequencies. So I'll show you an example so you can put this idea together. And then a relative frequency distribution lists each category of data with the relative frequency. So using the same information we just did from our previous example, we're gonna work on a relative frequency um, table. So the sum of all the values in the frequency column was 30. If you go back, you can count, and it was a total of 30. And so now we compute the relative frequency in each of the categories. So for example, if you remember back, there was a, um, 12 occurrences. So we take that, no that frequency and we divide it by the sum of the frequencies. So that's why it's 12 over 30, which is 0.4, or you can say that that's 40%. So you can interpret this as 40% of the patients surveyed um, had a back injury. So the relative frequency distribution is shown here. And so from the distribution, the most common part for rehab was the back. And you could tell from either the frequency or actually the relative frequency gives you that as well. Notice these relative frequencies are listed as decimals, but you can easily convert that to a percent uh, if that's more meaningful to you. So for example, if we just kind of go right here to shoulder, 
that would be 13.3% of the patients had a shoulder injury. Now, something to notice down here, you would want to check your work to see if the relative frequencies add up to one, because if you think of this as a percent, this represents 100%. So you can't have more or less than 100% if you're including all of the data. So when you add up all of the relative frequencies from your list, it should always equal one or 100%. Next, we're going to construct bar graphs. A bar graph is constructed by labeling each category of data on either the horizontal or vertical axis, and then the frequency or relative frequency is on the other axis. So once you decide which axis to put your categories on, then you just choose the other axis to be the relative or regular frequency. And then rectangles of equal width are drawn for each category, and then the height or if you're using horizontal bars, the length of each rectangle represents the category's frequency or relative frequency. So let's take a look at this example. We're going to use the data summarized in our previous example to construct a frequency bar graph and relative frequency bar graph. So notice the first one is our frequency graph and then the second one is our relative frequency. The widths of each rectangle are equal and then the height represents the frequency or relative frequency. And then notice that um, we do start at zero down here. And then we basically scale, in this case, our vertical axis to as high as we need to go uh, in terms of our, our biggest value, which was um, 12 for back, 12 uh, occurrences, or 40%. And so we're choosing to put the categories on the horizontal axis and then the frequencies on the vertical axis. Uh, caution, graphs that start the scale at some other value than zero or that have bars with unequal widths or different colors or even three-dimensional bars can misrepresent the data. So just be careful when you're either creating these or viewing them that nothing uh, strange is happening to make the data look a certain way. Um, you tend to want to start at zero and have things even, so un uh, even widths, and then make it easy to see. So now we're going to use a tool, our technology, to create this graph. So here is just an example from Excel. If you type the data into Excel, I'm going to have us go over to StatCrunch and try it there. Okay, so we're going to go down here to StatCrunch. And because this example actually comes from the book, we don't have to add um, our own data. I'm going to help you find it. So we're going to Go from the book. Okay, so we're in section 2.1. However, if I don't know which example it is, or maybe this is a homework question, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click up here, StatCrunch, and I'm just going to search for this. So I'm going to do data sets. And this had to do with uh, rehabilitation of an injury. So let's just type that in. And if we just read a little bit, a physical therapist wants to determine types of, okay, here it is, 2.1, example three. And notice there's our raw data. And the nice thing about using StatCrunch is depending on what we're wanting, like a graph, we can go right here. We want a bar graph, and we're just going to say with data. I have to select what I'm working with, which is the injury type. And then right here, I can choose either frequency or relative frequency. I'm just going to go with frequency. And it creates this bar graph for me. Let's do this again with relative frequency. So bar plot data. And we're going to do relative frequency. And there we have it. Okay, so now I'm going to take us over to Excel and try the same thing here. Um, now with Excel, we do have to sort our data. I'm sure there's other ways to do this, but I'm just going to go to data and sort alphabetically here. And then that's going to help me get a frequency. And so I can just start my categories here. I'll say back. And we have that back was 12. And we hadn't done this earlier. We had that information. Elbow looks like it's one. Oops. And then we just keep doing this. So let's get to it. Okay, so now that I have my frequencies, 
Let's go ahead and highlight this and we're going to insert a bar graph. So I'm going to just pick a 2D one and here we go. And we can edit this and change the height and things like that or make it um, my categories on the vertical axis, but that's our relative frequency or our, actually just a frequency uh, bar graph. Next, we're going to talk about a Pareto chart. So a Pareto chart is just a bar graph where the bars are drawn in a specific way to where they're decreasing in order of frequency or relative frequency. So nothing new, it's just a matter of how you're um, going to basically label one of your axes, the axis with your categories. So here is a relative frequency Pareto chart for our same data. Notice that we started with the um, most, the highest frequency, which was back, the next highest was knee, and so on. Okay. Now let's talk about side-by-side -side bar graphs. This is useful when you're comparing information. So suppose we want to know, for example, whether more people um, are finishing college today or in recent years than they were in 1990. So we can draw what's called a side-by-side -side bar graph to compare the data from the two different years. And so data sets should be compared by using relative frequencies. And this is because different sample sizes or, or population sizes make comparisons using just regular frequencies difficult or even misleading. And you'll see from our information here, our data. So this table represents adults 25 years or older who are residents of the United States and the um, education level they attained in the year 1990 or as of the year 1990 and as of the year 2017. Now what you'll notice if you just look at the frequencies, let's just pick one category. So associates degrees. It looks like compared to 1990 that doubled, that number doubled in 2017. But look at our totals down here. The total number of people in our uh, data set here is much larger for the year 2017. That's why it's important to do relative frequencies when we're doing comparisons like this. So we're going to take this information and put it into one of our charts. So we're going to draw a side-by-side -side relative frequency bar graph of the data. Notice what these are now are the percents or decimal versions of each of our categories. So it, remember how that calculation goes. You take the frequency divided by the total. That's how you get the relative frequency. And we did that for each of the categories for the two years. And now let's see what that looks like visually. So visually, it's much more informative, I think you would agree, because just seeing it, we can tell much more um, easily what's going on compared to just staring at the numbers over here in our table. If you see um, in blue, we have the 1990 information in green to 2017 information, and they're right next to each other for the category not a high school graduate. And we did this for each of our categories. And then in our vertical axis, we have our relative frequencies. So let's make some general conclusions based on our graph just by looking at it. So the relative frequency of adults who are not high school graduates in the year 2017 was about half from the year 1990, if you go back and look at that chart that we made. And in 2017, a much higher proportion of the adult population has at least a bachelor's degree. However, the proportion of the population with a bachelor's degree has not doubled, as we might have thought from the frequency table. It was just based on the relative frequencies, it didn't really double, but the number looks so large because we sampled more people. So let's just go back real quick and look at this. So about half the amount of people stopped at not a high school degree in 2017, half compared to 1990, just based on the visual from our height of our bar. And then our bachelor's degree, yes, there are more people with a bachelor's degree in 2017. However, it's not quite double like the frequency table made it appear based on the numbers. And so an overall conclusion is that adult Americans are more educated or attained more education in 2017 than they were in 1990 based on our graph. Here's another way we're going to look at this, just considering horizontal bars. Same information, 
but sometimes you might want to use horizontal bars, especially if your category names are long. So you can fit the longer names when you do it like this, as opposed to trying to squeeze all those category names down at the bottom of the horizontal axis. Our last objective for this section is to construct pie charts. So a pie chart is just a circle divided into sectors, like slices of a pie. Each sector represents one of the categories from our data, and then the area of each sector is proportional to the frequency of that category. And so the pie chart, you basically use a pie chart when you're considering parts of a whole. So it wouldn't be useful if you're comparing like two sets of data. So we have um, an example for this. It's gonna be the same example with the high school or the education levels, but we're only gonna focus on one year. So if we focus on the 2017 data, we have our frequencies in each category. And so the whole amount would be uh, the total number of people uh, in our um, sample set. So we have our frequencies and we're gonna take this from each category and find a relative frequency and construct a pie graph or pie chart. So notice down here, we have our categories, our frequency, but then to take your frequency, divide it by the total to get the relative frequencies. Now, in order to draw your pie chart, you actually have to get a lot of information ahead of time for drawing purposes. You can't start drawing just based off of one category and then add the next category. Not necessarily because you have to consider that all together you have to draw a full circle. And so one way to do that is to get the degree measure of each sector. Now, just a side note, we can use technology to make a pie chart. You don't necessarily have to do this by hand, but just so you know what the te technology is doing, or if you did wanna do it by hand, what you would consider is that 360 degrees makes up a circle. And so for each of our categories, we would take the relative frequency, which does represent a percent of the whole, and just times it by 360. So for example, if we look at the category not a high school graduate, the relative frequency 0.1201 or 12.01%. If we take that amount of the whole, times it by our 360 degrees that makes up our circle, the slice for that category has a 43 degree angle in it. And we can do that for each category. And the bigger the slice is because it would have a larger relative frequency or the larger frequency. So if you look at just our degree measures, the biggest one is 98 degrees, and that comes from high school diploma, which has the highest frequency and the highest relative frequency. So knowing the degree measures could help us do this by hand to draw our pie chart, um, but you would actually need like a protractor to get a pretty good accurate drawing. So here is our pie chart for this data. So we have our slices all together based on our categories. We have the whole amount of information from our 2017 educational attainment data. And notice our biggest slice is that high school diploma slice um, or sector. And if you recall, it was a 98 degree angle for the 27% of the sample that had a high school diploma. And so if you know anything about angles, 90 degrees is a right angle like the corner of a paper. And if you notice this angle right here is just a little bit more than 90 degrees. And our smallest slice is over here for associate's degrees. Only 9% of the people sampled had stopped at an associate's degree. And so this is the smallest slice of our pie. And therefore this angle would be the smallest out of all of them. Okay, that's it for this section. Thanks for watching.